I think network who will be sharing a case later on today. So we wanna thank Cynthia. Um, but before I get into the exciting parts of today, I just wanna go through some basic logistics. Um, as you know, our webinar is going to be recorded as we normally record our webinars. However, we're only gonna be recording the didactic section, which is kind of the first portion of the webinar. Um, when Cynthia gets to her case presentation, we are gonna stop recording so we can have a more full and robust discussion and conversation. So if you're looking for the recording, of the first portion of the webinar, bless you, Evelyn. Thank um, you. <laughs> you'll be able to find that behind the portal on the TTAC website in the coming days. So know that you'll have access to that. It's going to be some really wonderful content. Um, we are going to be taking questions um, throughout the webinar. So you folks who have joined us on webinars before are probably pretty familiar with this. You can absolutely chat in your questions using the chat box functionality. My colleague Ian, um, who is the TTAC admin on the back end, is helping to pull all the questions into a centralized document that Evelyn will review. But since we are going to have this opportunity um, when Cynthia is presenting her case to really have a conversation, we're encouraging you, if you don't want to chat in your questions, you can select the option to raise your hand, and I'm literally raising it on my screen, and what we can do is unmute you. So if you'd prefer to speak your question aloud, we can absolutely accommodate that. Um, Ian will be looking, Ian and Nicole will be looking out for raised hands, not literally on the screen, but actually um, you can raise your hand if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's the raise hand button. And if you click that, Ian and Nicole will know that you would like to speak up during the conversation today. So we're really excited about that. The other thing is I want to assure those of you who are LMSWs, LCSWs, or LMHCs that today's webinar is eligible for one and a half, 1.5 CEU credit hours. So in order for you to obtain that, we need you to be sure to log in through the Zoom link you received when you registered and to stay on for the entire duration of the webinar today. And then you'll receive further instructions after the, the webinar today on how to obtain those CEs. It does take a little bit of time for our system to process your attendance um, and for us to kind of share that with our, our colleagues at NYU, but you'll be able to obtain your CEs within the, the next few days. We're excited to offer those. Um, and then finally, at the end of the webinar, as we normally do, we are going to send out one of those feedback surveys using the chat box functionality. So Ian will send out a link in the chat box. You'll see it pop up. If you can click on it and fill it out, we truly do review all of the surveys that we receive and your feedback has, is always received very well and appreciated. We're constantly looking at how we can improve on these offerings. So um, any feedback you might have, we would we would greatly appreciate and, and take. Um, so with that, I think that gets me through all of the logistics. And I, I just want to thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to hand this over to my dear partner, um, Evelyn Blank, who is the executive director at the New York Center for Child Development and the director of our TTAC project. Evelyn? Thanks so much, Megan. First of all, welcome everybody and welcome to our partners from the Newborn Home Visiting Program and Nurse Family Partnership and really thrilled that you're joining us today. And again, we are so excited to be able to offer these two session series as a follow up to the perinatal mood and anxiety disorder that was done previously, which is on our website. And I hope everybody, if you didn't see it live, really had the opportunity to go back and view it. And so I'm thrilled to be joined today by Paige Bellamam and by Dr. Catherine Berndorf. And today we're really gonna take a deeper dive into perinatal anxiety disorders. And um, I have a special thank you to Cynthia Restrepo, who's really volunteered to present a case. And the way that we've structured these is we wanted to do a large webinar for kind of the general population for people across child serving systems, but really to give you the opportunity as the early childhood treatment centers, newborn home visiting and NFP to really have a chance to kind of take a deeper dive and also really take some of the concept and the theories and apply it to a real live case. So I'm really, really thrilled. I hope that you'll also plan to join us on June 9th, where we're going to focus on depression, bipolar depression, and psychosis. And I'm just really want to give a really warm welcome to Dr. Berndorf and to Paige Bellenbaum. So thank you very much. And uh, 
I will turn it over to you again. Please chat your questions in, raise your hand. We're gonna try and make this as interactive as we can, but we also wanna make sure that we're addressing what your concerns are. So thank you and just thrilled to have uh, both Paige and Dr. Berndorf here representing the Motherhood Center, so thank you. Well, thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, Megan, and thank you everybody for being here today. As I was explaining uh, to Evelyn and others prior to uh, this webinar beginning, uh, for those of you who are here representing Nurse Family Partnership, we actually are doing also another event with Nurse Family Partnership at the same time as this. We have two of our clinicians from the Motherhood Center that are speaking to nurses um, within NFP about uh, an English speaking and Spanish speaking support group, um, a free support group that we are offering to NFP participants all around perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and supporting uh, NFP new and expecting mothers uh, that are struggling uh, with the transition to motherhood. So just wanted to give that a shout out as well. Um, I'm assuming that uh, most of you, if not all of you, were able to attend our initial uh, training a few weeks ago. It was a general overview of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Today, Dr. Berndorf and I are really going to be focusing on perinatal anxiety disorders, of which you're going to be learning a lot more about um, as we move through the presentation today. Uh, and I just want to echo, we're, we're really excited to have this be interactive. Any questions or comments that come up, um, please feel free to jump right in. Um, and so the first few slides are just going to be uh, a little bit of a repeat uh, of what we had done the last time. Uh, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty of anxiety disorders in particular. I will say um, a lot of what we're sharing with you today, uh, we did rely on Postpartum Support International as a resource for a lot of this information, uh, which is up to date. Uh, and uh, you know, they are a great resource to learn more about PMADs and even to get um, a more extensive training in the area of PMADs. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, so as, as I think most of us know, uh, PMADs are perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. They are a group of illnesses that affect at least one in five new and expecting mothers, and they can cause emotional and physical problems that make it hard for women to function adequately. For example, being able to care for themselves and or their babies. What I always like to add when we talk about the statistics is that we have seen a significant increase in PMATs as a direct result of the pandemic. There was a research study uh, that just came out of um, Michigan University. I Forgive me if I'm misquoting this, Dr. Berndorf will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it was one of the latest bodies of research that just came out that found uh, that at least a third of new and expecting mothers have been experiencing PMADS as a result of the pandemic. So that just gives us a sense of, of really the increased rates that I'm sure all of you have been experiencing on the front lines as you're working with new and expecting mothers. Uh, and I always like to add, because I don't think we can ever remember enough why PMATs are important, uh, because they impact so many new and expecting mothers, uh, because up to 80% of PMATs go undiagnosed and untreated, and this is because of stigma, lack of awareness, and a scarcity of specialized PMAD treatment options. We know that low-income women and low-income women of color experience PMADS at a disproportionately higher rate. Uh, we know that 50% of PMADS develop during pregnancy, even though we refer to postpartum depression and the postpartum, it's important to note that half of all cases originate during pregnancy and the other half originate uh, within the first year of postpartum. They are the number one complication associated with childbirth. So when we think about hypertension, gestational diabetes, all of these other physical conditions that perinatal women experience, uh, everybody's tested for gestational diabetes, everybody's screened, but yet PMADs are the number one complication and screening is still not a federal mandate. Untreated PMADs can lead to poor mother-baby attachment and developmental delays in children. And sadly, uh, and most importantly of all, PMADs are the leading cause of maternal mortality in New York City and in the United States. I have the honor of sitting on New York City DOHMH's uh, Maternal Morbidity uh, Review Committee. 
Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, and we actually met this week looking at these very specific cases. Um, and it is alarming how many uh, here in New York City are directly related to mental health in the perinatal period. There's, there's actually a hand that went up. So Nicole, I don't know whether you wanna, uh, whether we can unmute her and let her ask her question. Nicole, did you have a question you wanted to raise or? Okay, if not, you can chat it in the chat box and we're happy to address that. Thank you, Paige. Great. And just a, a refresher, and I wanted to bring this slide back up again, despite the fact that we, we did learn about this the first time around, because I know that one of the things that comes up in our case presentation is around good enough mothering, which is something that we eat, sleep, and breathe at the Motherhood Center. Uh, and, you know, it, it fits in nicely with the stigmas and the societal expectations that exist that surround motherhood, right? We live in a culture that very much so romanticizes and glamorizes motherhood. Motherhood has become an industry. Uh, and what we see in relation to motherhood all around us are social media posts, commercials, movies, you name it, that put forward this very glamorized, romanticized, perfectionist version of motherhood. And when it is all around us and we see it everywhere, we think that that's what it's supposed to look like or what it should look like. And we compare ourselves to that. And for those of you who are mothers in, in, in with us today or worked with mothers, you know it's anything but that. Motherhood is messy. It's incredibly hard. Sometimes it can feel like the hardest thing a new mother has ever done. Uh, and so because of this, women stay silent. They don't come forward with the symptoms that they're experiencing and some of the uh, scary intrusive thoughts that we're gonna learn a little bit more about today. Uh, in, in, in our society, mental illness in and of itself is taboo, especially maternal mental illness and mental health. Um, again, women don't talk about it because they think that motherhood is supposed to be a happy time and a blissful time and we're supposed to be a super mom and we have all of this amazing uh, ability to understand our babies and, and, and we just know what to do, right? Because that's kind of what we've learned and have been told. Uh, you know, so many women, because of this stigma, often ask themselves, what's wrong with me, right? Like everywhere I look, everyone I talk to is having this very different experience. I must be the only person who's feeling this way. Uh, I'm not a perfect mom. Uh, and I love that, that again, in our case presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about good enough mothering. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Winnicott, who uh, was the founder of the term good enough mothering, a psychologist, um, from the 1950s. Uh, family, friends, and doctors don't ask for many reasons. Uh, there was a, a social media post that came out recently that referred to a new mother as a candy wrapper, uh, right? While a mother is pregnant, the candy wrapper is around the candy. And then when the baby comes out, i.e. the candy, the wrapper is kind of cast aside, right? There's so much focus on the baby uh, after the baby comes that oftentimes mothers are forgotten. There's so much guilt, shame, and isolation, and worry, uh, again, so relevant to what we're going to be speaking about today in regards to anxiety. And this isolation in particular has been significantly played up in the pandemic. Women have had little to no help or support around them for the past two years. And then if I tell anyone what I'm thinking or feeling, they're going to take my baby away. Um, and I think that this impacts specifically women of color, um, that there is a fear that if they are honest about how they're feeling, that there might be ACS involvement or their, or their child might be taken from them. And I think that that causes a lot of women not only to stay silent, but also if they are screened by their OBGYN or their pediatrician or another provider, sometimes they don't necessarily answer the questions honestly because of these fears. Um, of what might happen if I tell the truth. I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Berndorf now. Thanks, Paige. Um, and um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about a group of disorders today um, called, what, they're anxiety disorders. And so those of you who are clinicians on on um, the webinar will be familiar with these more or less. And then we're gonna sort of describe what's 
um, qualitatively a little bit different about them in the perinatal period. And so though Paige has sort of indicated this and you may know from the last time, perinatal is during and after pregnancy. We generally say up to a year after pregnancy, but as we, most people know that it, it, things don't end, you know, at a year postpartum, um, things can still be very difficult and it may very well be related to uh, what happened in and around pregnancy and birth and that first year. So um, we always are con conscious of that. Um, as a group, perinatal anxiety disorders include panic disorder. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder is in here, but I, I, we include it um, thematically, but, but the DSM, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, um, has taken it out it's its own category now. It used to be in the anxiety disorders category. Um, we're including it here because, um, again, thematically it's similar, but we'll just to know that. Um, and generalized anxiety disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder are also um, very commonly appear uh, in the postpartum and uh, they can be happening during pregnancy. And as we're gonna hear about, there's a lot of comorbidities. So, a lot of times when people have one disorder, they'll have another. So not at all uncommon to have both depress a depressive disorder and an anxiety disorder, um, which can often be confusing. Um, so we're gonna talk about what these all are and more specifics, each one. So Paige, if you wanna. Okay, so, and again, please interrupt. I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. If, you know, um, just happy to chat about this more informally. Um, panic disorder is uh, one of the anxiety disorders. Um, anxiety disorders in general are characterized by a, um, a physical sensation or experience in addition to apprehension and dread. That's kind of a general kind of overarching way to think about anxiety disorders. Um, this one is characterized by unexpected and repeated episodes of intense fear that's accompanied by physical symptoms. People will say, oh my gosh, I'm having a panic attack. They can happen anytime, anywhere, and without warning. People often try to relate them to something, and sometimes that's doable. Oftentimes it's not. So the symptoms that go along with this, and again, to have a disorder, you have to meet certain numbers of, of these um, symptoms, and this has to happen over a certain period of time. There, there are certain diagnostic criteria, but we'll we're, we're more descriptive today saying, so a sudden feeling of terror when there's no real danger, um, a feeling, uh, uh, a loss of control. So people feel um, like they don't know what's going on. There can be confusion and like um, just a, a general sense of out of controlness, claustrophobia, a racing heart, chest or stomach pain, breathing difficulties, weakness, dizziness, sweating, hot and cold, people will get clammy hands, then they'll be hot and sweaty, um, tingly or numbness, tingling or numb hands can also occur. And everybody's probably had some version of this at some point in their life in some upsetting situation, but to have panic disorder, these symptoms have to be recurrent. Panic attacks have to be recurrent and, and the person having it has to anticipate having another and feel worried about that. So there's an anticipatory anxiety piece of it that goes along with this. Some of the risk factors that is true, this is true for most um, uh, mental illnesses or um, psychiatric disorders really are often a personal history in the past or a family history. Very, very common. I would just add, um, you know, a, a lot of women that we treat at the Motherhood Center that have experienced a uh, panic attack or multiple panic attacks, especially the first time, think it's a heart attack. Um, aren't entirely sure what's going on and we'll call 911 and we'll end up in the ER thinking that it's some type of a physical situation and are oftentimes told then for the first time you're having a panic attack. That's what this is. I would also add to that page, um, women often um, get told they're having anxiety and men get told they're having heart conditions. So it's, it's unfortunately a little gendered, which um, can be problematic because Women also have cardiac disease and maybe actually having a heart attack and men also have anxiety, although it is twice as likely in women than it is in men. So, you know, you could argue, okay, for there's some, um, there's some biological truth to what's being said, but I, I, I always say to people, don't, don't let, some, let someone tell you something's in your head. You should still get a medical workup 
you should still make sure things are okay. If you go to a, if an ER with, with these symptoms, you better be getting worked up for a cardiac issue and make sure that that gets rolled out. Okay, sorry. Um, generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD. So this is, this is one of the most common, um, approximately 6% of pregnant women and 10% of postpartum women um, can have this. They, um, they will often have it comorbid. It's a very comorbid disorder with uh, depression. And it's really the way I describe this when I'm teaching medical students and others is worry, worry, worry all the time. Are you a worry ward? This is the easiest way to think. I think about it at least. Um, so it, what is hard, and this is what I mentioned, like qualitatively, you should be a little bit anxious in pregnancy and postpartum because you're gestating a baby and you have to be protective. Like there's a Darwinian need for, for one to protect what they are um, uh, gestating. And also in postpartum, right? There's a, vul a vulnerable little um, baby, right? Winnicott is also famously to have said, there's no such thing as a baby, indicating like the baby can't exist alone. A baby and mother um, or primary caretaker uh, 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 coexist. Um, at least for a period of time. So um, it, it's, it's really important that um, you can, it's, and it's hard to discern what is normal anxiety, so to speak, and I'm doing air quotes here, but like, you know, there, there's a, you should be a little bit um, concerned, but not so much so that you aren't able to do the normal things in your life, things that you need to do to take care of yourself and to function. Um, so the way you determine if the worry is too much is, by intensity and functioning, um, and is it going on? Are you um, struggling in these sort of extremes for more than a month's period of time um, with sort of constant chronic worry that, that, that feeling like something bad is gonna happen? Again, you can have racing thoughts. You'll see the themes throughout here. Sleep and appetite get disturbed because you sort of wake up thinking about things. You go to sleep thinking about things. Oh, you can't fall asleep, you're thinking about things. Um, you can have disturbances of sleep and appetite, sitting still, feeling dizzy, hot flashes, nausea. And so again, is this a panic, right? You see the, you see the relationship, you see how um, related these are. And again, uh, previous history. And another thing to worry, to think about with anxiety disorders at large are thyroid disorders. So you also, in addition to, if you're having acute symptoms, you also may wanna rule out thyroid dysfunction. Almost always when I meet a patient for the first time, uh, you know, I check in on cardiac history, but usually these are younger women, unless there's a strong family history, I do want to see thyroid function tests to make sure that there's no thyroid imbalance because that can mimic um, anxiety disorders and other depressive disorders as well. All right, so uh, I think uh, this is the, a big one. Um, perinatal OCD. Um, is really, really important. And I think in some ways, this is the most confusing thing we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'll tell you, since we started the Motherhood Center five years ago, I've never seen anything quite like what we've, you know, we treat some very um, ill women who really are struggling with tremendous, uh, tremendous symptom load. And while I did, I've been doing this pretty much all my academic career for the last 25 years, it, it, we're seeing this, it feels like we're seeing it more and more. I may have a self-select population now, even more so, but um, it, it, there's, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it, but it's, this can get missed because people think of these, you know, oh, I, I have OCD. It's a very sort of common, like, oh, you're so OCD. It gets thrown around colloquially if you're someone who's very neat or cleans up or like sort of perspicity, right? And so, and that, get, that happens with depression and anxiety as well. But these are real illnesses and we do not want to miss them because they are debilitating and they are really not great when you are pregnant and not able to do certain things because you're so busy. You can't get to your appointments because you're cleaning and neatening and straightening and checking and washing and right. They're, they're very um, inhibiting in terms of um, being able to move through life. Uh, and so anyhow, so I just wanna stress that these are very real and very, and not uncommon. Um, three to 5% of, of new mothers will experience these symptoms. We know in the general population, um, it's somewhat similar. Uh, they can be, um, right, again, any woman 
uh, who's pregnant or a new mom can have some of the symptoms. The question is, how long are they going on? Are they happening for, you know, oh, I, it, it occurred to me that I forgot to check my door. Or are you going back to check your door? Are you unable to leave because you're checking, checking, check, right? How much time does it take up in a day, right? OCD is obsessions are thoughts that go round and round repetitively, intrusively. The C is compulsions. Those are actions that go round and round uh, or actions that you do over and over again. Washing, counting, checking, cleaning, hoarding, straightening, neatening, evening, um, numbering. There are all different ways that these can express themselves. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I have this. I mean, lots of people have small versions of all of these things that we're describing. Those don't make disorders. Okay, this is different. Um, all right, Paige, I think. So some of the symptoms, right? We've just talked about obsessions are persistent, intrusive thoughts. They're repetitive. They can be mental images related to the baby. Very much in OCD, perinatal OCD, you know, it'll be related to the pregnancy. Something's wrong. I don't, you know, I don't feel movements, counting, checking movements in the postpartum. It will be about baby's health. Is baby safe? Baby's not breathing. I have to check, check, putting your, uh, you'll see moms who can't sleep at night because they're checking. They're putting their hands over the baby's mouth to make sure or on their chest to make sure they're breathing. Um, some of the compulsions. So I'm mixing for you both com compulsions and obsessions. And what people do to neutralize the fears often when you have the thoughts is you go do actions. Okay. The compulsions sometimes make it, make you feel better for a second. They take a lot of time. They don't actually make you feel, they don't solve the problem. They are actually part of the problem. So believe it or not, and as horrible as it sounds, one of the treatments, the most uh, probably effective treatment in OCD is exposure response prevention. So it's literally saying you cannot get reassurance for what you're doing because it's reinforcing the illness, right? So it's counterintuitive, but let me tell you, it extinguishes behavior. It, extin it really, really works. Now, there's so many caveats to that, but I've just that's just a little window. Um, so what you can see with this is a sense of horror about the obsession, uh, obsessions. People are very distressed by this. These are ego dystonic, does not feel good. When they're ego syntonic, meaning it does jibe with reality, we're talking more along the lines of a psychosis. That has to be distinguished from more of this um, neurotic, I'm speaking kind of old fashioned here, um, sense where things are reality based, but they're very uncomfortable. People get hypervigilant regarding the baby. They're scared to leave the infants alone. Um, baby's health, as we talked about. And uh, one of the things that makes this a hard thing to discern is when you're talking to somebody um, is, is really trying to figure out, they don't wanna tell you about their intrusive thoughts. Sometimes they're violent and upsetting and disturbing. Um, and I was gonna show you a book. This is such a great book. I happen to have on my shelf. Good moms, have, good moms Have Scary Thoughts. It's such a wonderful resource that a colleague of ours wrote because she just lays it all out, right? And it's just so cool because we all have these intrusive thoughts. Like if I walk in front of the bus, are we gonna be hit and killed? That's an intrusive thought. It's like 100% anyone can have them. And yet for some people, it's a disorder. Okay, I'm going, I could go on about this forever and ever. Okay, maybe the next slide. We can talk more about this and if there are questions, we're gonna, we have a case about this too. Just, I, I, I wanna pause for just a second, Catherine, because I'm thinking of so many cases of, of OCD that we've treated and I wanna boil it down just a little bit more if we can, like how it shows up, right? Like, and, and chime in here, right? Like I'm thinking of patients that have had, one in particular who had an obsession with lead um, and that was, you know, the OCD fixation that she had. She was convinced lead was everywhere and, went, and, and you know, went through numerous compulsions to help manage her obsession with the lead. Um, I'm also thinking of a patient that we have right now that we're treating um, who uh, has been diagnosed with OCD and has been fixated on a lip condition um, that she has, right? Like one of the things that we see a lot, whether it's OCD in regards to the baby's health or the mother's health, is that, um, you know, going to, as Catherine was saying, going to one doctor and being told this is what it is, is never enough. This is a patient who will go to another doctor and another doctor and another doctor and another doctor. Um, we had one patient who 
um, was experiencing OCD during pregnancy and I think had gone across state lines to go and see another OBGYN um, to get a, a, a fetal scan because she was convinced that there was something wrong with the baby, despite the fact that she um, had been to her own OBGYN multiple times and was told everything's fine, everything's fine. So it, it's like, it, it doesn't ever, it usually doesn't ever stop. It just keeps going and going and going. Absolutely true. I mean, the examples are, I was saying, I've never seen so much of it as since we opened the motherhood center. And again, these are, they can be very quiet um, disorder. Like you don't know someone's doing this. They're not telling you, you might pick it up if you observe, but the more you ask about it, the more you'll hear. Again, people don't want to share this because it's embarrassing. It feels they, they're on some level, they feel crazy, shall we say, you know, I mean, it's really awful and it's so um, prohibitive in terms of living life. So um, these can be very, very extreme. And we see that. Um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. PTSD. So approximately 9% of women experience PTSD following childbirth. Um, you can sometimes see this during birth. What happens is this can be a chronic illness from past experiences of trauma either um, trauma that you've experienced yourself or trauma that has been witnessed. Um, we see a lot of trauma, women who've um, experienced trauma uh, at the motherhood center. And we also know that birth itself constitutes a trauma. It is not traumatic for everyone, but it can be. We often say big T, little T. Um, and for some people, the you know big T trauma is the birth and, and it's a perception, right? Trauma is in the, I, I don't know who said this, trauma is in the eye of the beholder doesn't matter if you think your hangnail is, you know, a problem or not. If somebody else does, it may be perceived that way. And then big things that happen may, you know, that you would think would be a trauma or traumatic event are not to other people. So we can't say what will cause it. I mean, we do know that, um, you know, wars and um, adverse conditions uh, can be traumas and chronically uh, can create PTSD. Um, so some of the traumas around birth that we'll specifically, um, that we're talking about in perinatal PTSD include things like a prolapsed cord, an unplanned C-section. Again, one person's trauma is another person. Oh, I, okay, C-section's fine. Um, use of vacuum extractors or forceps to deliver baby. Uh, again, you might not think it's a trauma, but if the if woman having that happen to her experiences it that way, it's a trauma. And what are we going to do? And is it going to take hold? And are we going to have nightmares, flashbacks, and all the symptoms that go along with it because of this? Um, there are feelings of powerlessness. Uh, poor communication can contribute to that. Lack of support, lack of reassurance. COVID during this period of time when women um, were delivering alone or were not allowed to have family members visit, hugely traumatic. Um, again, not for everybody, but for, for many particularly uh, women who've had sexual abuse or histories of uh, different kinds of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse will re-experience that around delivery, right? Um, it, it, you, it, there's so much, everyone has a history, therefore everyone's had experiences that are going to contribute to what's happening around birth. And birth is such a highly, um, often beautiful and volatile time that so much gets triggered. And for some people that that, that is a continuation of what has been PTSD and others, it will start anew. Um, right, hemorrhaging, hysterectomies, unexpectedly, preeclampsia, perinatal trauma, tears, cardiac disease. It, it's just, it's fraught. <laughs> Sometimes when I think about this, I think, how does anyone, you know, how is it ever straightforward? Um, but not everybody experiences all these things we've just named as trauma. Um, okay, so what happens in PTSD? You have this intrusive re-experiencing of a past traumatic event, and it might be the childbirth itself, right? There are flashbacks or nightmares. There's avoidance of stimuli associated with the event, people's place, people, places, and things. So like, maybe you don't go back to the hospital. Maybe you switch midwives or doctors or care centers where you receive health because you're like, I'm not going back there. Look what happened to me there. And it becomes something to like, you go on different routes on the street. You don't, you can't go back to the neighborhood. Um, there's an increased arousal, irritability, difficulty sleeping, hypervigilance, startle response. You get women who you, they'll tell you they are sort of jacked up um, and it's experienced that's increased arousal. 
anxiety, panic attacks can happen. Um, and then uh, feelings of unreality and detachment. I mean, this is a big deal. Th these are all big deal illnesses, but these are things that if you can distinguish them, we can actually try to treat and understand what's happening and help women um, get better. All right. So I just want to pause for a second because I know that that, that was a lot of clinical information about the different um, the different diagnoses that fall under the umbrella of PMADS um, in the in the anxiety family and see if, if anyone has any questions uh, about any of those diagnoses or symptoms or risk factors before we move forward. There's nothing in the chat, but if you raise your hand, if you'd like to raise something, that would be great. Okay, um, so we'll move forward with treatment approaches. And again, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, so there's a number of treatment approaches that we employ at the Motherhood Center and our best practices in addressing these different anxiety disorders in the perinatal period. Um, uh, you know, I, I will lead with collaboration. Uh, anxious patients find it very helpful when they have a treatment team approach. Um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, we do often as much as we can try to keep treatment and outpatient in house with us um, so that we have a reproductive psychiatrist and therapist, both at the motherhood center, treating the patient at the same time so that everybody can be on the same page. Collaboration can, can, can really, um, you know, ease the anxiety. Cognitive behavioral therapy, I'd say is like the gold standard um, with a lot of these different diagnoses. And I listed a couple of specific exercises um, and practices within, within CBT that can be very helpful exercises, cognitive restructuring or reframing, guided discovery, exposure therapy, as Catherine referenced earlier, journaling and thought records, activity scheduling and behavior activation. Uh, I wanted to, to mention two books um, that we refer to constantly at the Motherhood Center in regards to anxiety disorder, anxiety disorders. Uh, Amy Wenzel and Karen Kleiman, who also wrote Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts that Catherine showed a few moments ago, uh, wrote a great book called CBT for Perinatal Distress. That's a wonderful resource to learn a little bit more about um, the diagnostic um, and also treatment approaches and best practices. Uh, another uh, go-to book for us was written by Pamela Weigartz and Kevin Giorki, and I'm probably saying that wrong, but Kevin will uh, correct me. Um, and that's the Pregnancy and Postpartum Anxiety Workbook. I love this because it actually has exercises that are created specifically for perinatal women um, that are experiencing anxiety. Um, so that in and of itself is a gold mine. <clears throat> Dialectical behavior therapy, um, you know, for those of you who uh, are, are, are not familiar is also another gold standard. I would say um, primarily when you look at the four pillars, the most applicable to those that are experiencing uh, anxiety disorders would be distress tolerance. Well, the most would be distress tolerance um, and really helping women identify other things to do while they are, um, you know, while they are experiencing uh, that obsessive thought or feeling the need to act out that compulsion. So that can be one of the most effective pillars of DBT uh, to implement uh, as an intervention. Um, Marsha Linehan is the godmother of everything DBT. She wrote the DBT skills training manual. If you don't have it, it's a must have. And she also, there's a, uh, another, um, version that goes along with the training manual, which is all of the skills, training handouts and worksheets. So there's a number of wonderful exercises in here, particularly in the direct distress tolerance pillar um, that can be very effective in treating anxiety disorders. Medication um, can be a wonderful resource. And when I'm done going through these, maybe Catherine can talk just for a brief second about um, what medications typically are prescribed um, to treat these anxiety disorders. Protected sleep, 
studies show poor sleep increases the risk of perinatal anxiety and depression. Sleep is so critical and yet it's so hard in the perinatal period, particularly the postpartum. Uh, but, but getting a, a good solid amount of sleep really can minimize and decrease the acuity of these symptoms. If there is a partner involved, uh, we oftentimes as part of the treatment plan will work very carefully with, with the couple, particularly the partner in ensuring that this new mother's sleep is protected um, and that he or she as partner are taking the majority of the night shift so that mom can get that sleep that she desperately needs. Uh, and then finally, um, exercise. Other than therapy, exercise is probably the single best thing you can do to behaviorally, uh, behaviorally to reduce anxiety. Um, so these are some of the best practices and interventions that we utilize frequently. <clears throat> so there's one question and somebody asked, is there any difference of frequency of uh, perinatal issues, uh, first pregnancy or subsequent pregnancies? It's a great question. We, um, generally speaking, uh, um, Depression is, if, uh, the way I distinguish that is to say, depression, it tends to be, if you've had one episode, the chances of having another are 50%, two episodes, 75, three episodes, uh, it's just when. And that, that's more episodic, whereas anxiety tends to be more chronic. Anxiety disorders tend to be more chronic and, um, and they can flare at uh, stressful times in life. So um, the question was more frequently, I talked so much I forgot the question. Um, frequency of perinatal issues, first pregnancy, first seven. What, what I would say is that we have some, you know, um, regarding um, anxiety, probably not, um, like psychosis is more common. A postpartum psychosis is often a first pregnancy that's in a prime, prime Prime, prime paris, primiparous woman um, having a first baby, but but generally it can happen at any time. I don't know that I would. I don't know that we have the uh, epidemiolo epidemiologic data to say. Um, but again, it sort of has to do with pregnancy being a stressful time, postpartum being a stressful time. A stressor will trigger illness, um, so it is a time where a heightened time when when illness can occur. Um, both episodically and for chronic illness, but you know, first or second, I, I would also argue that adverse life events, what's happening around those times, circumstances may be different. So um, maybe is my answer, <laughs> could be, um, but to be on the look. And also to recognize that sometimes things get missed in a first pregnancy or a second pregnancy or a third pregnancy. And it's not until the fourth pregnancy or whatever, the second pregnancy where you're like, oh, I was actually anxious and depressed in the first one, right? So it may not have been identified um, because often it takes, it takes time for someone to um, come to uh, acknowledge or come to treatment um, when they have a disorder. But it, you are set up, right? Like if it happens once, it's likely to happen again. So I, I would argue that for somebody who doesn't have a family or personal history um, and it happens once, you're more likely to have it again because there's your personal history. And before we move over um, and hand the mic over to Cynthia, uh, Dr. Berndorf, what are some of some examples oh. of common medications used to treat these disorders? So this is about at minimum a 90 minute lecture on medications in the perinatal period, but I'm gonna give it to you in one minute. Um, we use lots of medications um, that are we consider relatively safe. That is in psychiatric, for psychiatric meds, it's almost all of them, okay? There are very few that we throw out and say, if you can help it, don't be on Depakote, okay? If you can help it, don't be on chemotherapy. I mean, like in, in psychiatric terms, there really aren't that many meds that are like, oh my gosh, don't take that. Some of the seizure meds um, that get used for bipolar illness like Valproate, otherwise known as Depakote or um, uh, Tegretol. Again, do I use them in pregnancy? If I have to, I will. And you monitor and you look for what is known, but we use all the time lithium and um, all the SSRIs and all the SNRIs, um, sertraline, fluoxetine, fluvoxetine, you know, like, uh, then the fact, I mean, I can name them all, 
almost invariably they are considered relatively safe. When I started doing this 25 years ago, I could not say that to you. I am telling you that now after lots of research and data. This is true also of the antipsychotic medications, right? First generation, second generations, there are very few that we would say that we would pause. And really, when people ask me, they used to call and say like, what's the best med for this? What's the best med for that? The answer to that, which I used to not be able to answer so easily is what works for the patient. A woman needs to be well. So people get very caught on the idea of medications. I'm just boiling it down to almost all are considered relatively safe. And the ones that work the best are the ones that work for the person. Not like, oh, there's more research on this, go to that. Don't switch things up, stick with what works. Maternal euthymia is the gold standard. What that means is mom being well is the best thing for a pregnancy and for a birth and for a baby. So we tend to keep people on medications. In fact, sometimes we increase medications because symptoms, um, the dilutional, dilutional, um, effectively dilutional, it's the physiology of pregnancy is such that sometimes you dilute medications in pregnancy. Um, so you need more, not less. Uh, but, but these are complicated questions um, nonetheless. And um, this is my favorite area this is what I do most of the time is talk about this. And, and really what you're doing is you're helping a woman and her family make the best decision for herself. And sometimes the choice is to remain symptomatic and not take the medication, but it's kind of like you want to just, it's a risk risk. It's your risk of illness versus you, it, symptoms versus your risk of medication. And you want to understand that and move forward with the best, best um, plan you can. That said, 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. So most of the time people are, find out they're pregnant and they're on their medications or not and need them. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was really important because I, as I think I mentioned in the last presentation, um, what can be so very heartbreaking is when a woman is told to go off her medication or quit cold turkey when she finds out she's pregnant because there's a misunderstanding. A provider probably does or might not have appropriate information on the safety and efficacy of meds during pregnancy and postpartum. And then there's a liability factor, right? And so when you when we have a woman who comes to us that is, you know, floridly symptomatic because she stopped her meds because somebody told her to go off, that didn't have to happen. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of resources out there for doctors to call and, and, and be counseled on, on what a woman can stay on um, and speak with a, a, a reproductive psychiatrist. But um, anywho, without further ado, we have Cynthia who's prepared a case presentation for us. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia. And Cynthia, you just let me know 